most people will say is th there will be that you know he's the, now the Chancellor of the University of Manchester, and there's a general silence, and he beat Peter Mandelson. <laughs> just, you see, see that, that that's that's what happens. You see, like, well, he's the Chancellor. Oh, oh, he, uh, he which is uh, which is all good. Um, yeah, I was going to say to you that uh, and share with you that I'm sorry about the podium, by the way. I've noticed that nobody else is on a podium. Do you know what I mean? And I've got a podium, and I can never use a podium without thinking of um, Police Academy. Uh, <laughs> so we'll just uh, get rid of that uh, image for ourselves. Um, there are, oh dear me, we could split up into workshops and discuss that joke, actually, within this particular environment, and rightly so. That happened to me yesterday, coming here. Um, there are more written words uh, being communicated to more people in more ways now, written words, than ever before since the beginning of humanity. When I said this to Andrew Marr uh, live on BBC Radio a few weeks ago uh, in London, his name is pronounced Marr. Uh, in Manchester, it's Andrew Marr. <laughs> um, <laughs> But anyway, he said something like, yeah, but, you know, there may be more words written by more people since humanity. Big statement, Lem. He said, but what about the quality? What about the quality? And I said, yeah, what about the quality? <laughs> and uh, he went on to say, uh, you know, uh, about the canons. And I said, yeah, the truth is, I didn't say, yeah, what about the quality? when he immediately came back with that statement about there being more words used and written by more people in more ways since the beginning of the time. The way I answered him when he said, what about the quality line was, yeah, yeah, true, yeah, yeah probably uh, not, some, not some good quality. <laughs> the canon depended on being chosen by a few self-defined standard bearers. Uh, now we crowdsource for standards, not something that any artist should ever do. Uh, and this, this doesn't lower the bar, uh, it raises the game. And the same is happening in boardrooms and in charities across the country. When people ask, why are there no women here? In a similar way, the question of diversity and quotas, it doesn't lower the bar, it raises the game. These are revolutionary times. It's easy to say, well, why should we have quotas? Uh, but there have always been quotas. Uh, it's easy to say, why should we have positive dis discrimination? But there's, there's always been positive discrimination. There's been so much positive discrimination that we don't even see that it has applied to most of our boardrooms and companies and education systems. The positive discrimination has been for one type of people and when you ask them to positively discriminate to redress the balance, it makes sense that they would turn around and say, well, we can't do that. Uh, it's, it, it's got to be on merit. <laughs> what about the quality? <laughs> yes, Andrew, what about the quality? We are part of a privileged generation that bridges before the internet and after the internet, after digitization. And that is a unique experience which comes with great responsibility. As we die out, uh, there will be a world that has only ever known digitization. It won't be augmented reality, it will be reality. As we pass away, the new normal. Um, my name's Lem Sisse, and uh, when I was born, uh, a few miles from here, a social worker, because it is personal, a social worker uh, decided to name me uh, Norman Greenwood so I could sort of blend in. <laughs> 18 years later, uh, when I left the children's homes, I was given my birth certificate. It read Lem Sisse. Uh, I took the only truth that I'd known up until that point, and that was my name. Uh, I spent most of my life, adult life searching the world, I apologise for looking down, for uh, searching the world for my uh, birth family. Uh, with this and with the internet, I can safely say that there is only one person in the entire world with my name. Uh, this makes me incredibly easy to Google and uh, have at least one thing in common with Fifi Trixabel Geldof. It has become my advantage, counterintuitive. Uh, it also means that when I lose my wallet, 
I can be found. <laughs> it's spelt L-E-M for mother, N for nice. Uh, not as the woman in Piccadilly Starbucks said yesterday, M for mother, M for mice. <laughs> I write poetry by trade. People say that it's a vehicle to fame, but you'd be a bit stupid if you wanted to be famous and thought, poetry. <laughs> uh, once in Holland, a woman, the MC, asked me, I'll be there in a few days, actually, she said, who sh how shall I introduce you? Uh, this means she's got no idea who I am. <laughs> and I said, just say uh, he does what he loves and he loves what he does. She s went on stage and she said, Lem Chiche, uh, he does what he likes and likes what he does. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a writer. Um, I used to do workshops uh, in schools, but I don't do them anymore, not since the court case. Chil <laughs> Children in school, you deserve to laugh. It's been a long day, you know what I mean? Enjoy. Actually, it's been a long and good day, I, I, I've seen and, and watched. Um, children in schools would say to me, are you famous? And I'd say, the answer's in the question, pal. Um, I, I, I used to say... I used to say to them, I'm not going to patronise any of you, and the teachers would hate that. And then I'd follow through, do any of you know what patronising means? <laughs> um, teachers back on board. Uh, a flight attendant on a plane said, uh, sat next to me once, and I'm a writer, I said to her, and uh, what does a writer do, she says. And I, it seemed churlish to say, write. <laughs> uh, so I said, I do reading. She looked down at her palms, <laughs> and she said, will you read mine? That's true. Uh, for me, digitisation is personal. Uh, I want to show you how it is personal to me and, and my story, or as we know it now, my narrative. Uh, family is a group of web developers arguing over the code, over who put what line where at what time, under what mental condition, and how that has affected each individual programme and the overall performance Christmas dinner. Family is a collection of marketing and PR company uh, executives arguing over the narrative that needs to be established for the growth strategy to enable sales of the hardware cross-platform. <laughs> uh, so my story, every, uh, every four months since the day I was born, a report has been written about me from then up until 18 years of age. It was done in secret and the files locked away, select paragraph, delete capitals. My mother came to this country uh, in the mid-60s. She came to study, she was pregnant. Uh, that's the problem with women, they get pregnant. Uh, well, part of the reason I think that people hated pregnant women in the 60s and 70s in such a way that they would be locked away if they were not married is because I've thought about this before, I'm going to swear, but when a woman's pregnant, she can't be fucked. <laughs> She's in total womanhood. Whether we believe that women are defined by being a woman as, uh, when they're pregnant or not. But there is something really dark about what happened to women in the 60s, and my mother came right into the heart of that. I know Steve Coogan, and I know that Philomena was his arrival into, the, into this incredible story. Um, with her pregnancy, she could, be, she could infect the other women. She came to this country to study, and uh, she was sent to the other side of the country, to the north, to have a baby on Plodder Lane in Bolton, 30 minutes away. She was interred in a mother and baby home run by nuns. All they needed was the signature uh, to adopt the child. She asked the social worker that her child be fostered for a short period of time while she studied and then she'd return after her studies and take her child back to Ethiopia from whence she came. She mopped the floors of the mother and baby home day and night and uh, worked for her keep while I grew inside her. The social worker visited to put the pressure on, signed the adoption papers. She said, no, I want my child fostered. So I was born and the social worker found foster parents for me, north of England, treat this as an adoption, he said to them. He's yours forever. Uh, we'll get her to sign. Uh, his name is Norman. Um, this is a photograph of Norman. Um, all I knew was that look at you. <laughs> all I knew is that my mum, you can tell I'm not a PowerPoint, but you're like, oh, well. But anyway, all I knew is that my, my mum and dad were my mum and dad forever. That's what they, that, that they gave me free memory um, and they programmed me. My birth mother was an evil woman from a corrupt land and, and she left me and they saved me. Uh, uh, but out of spite, she would not sign the adoption papers, download, click, cut, paste. Each day, paste. Each birthday, paste. Each Christmas, paste. I was loved. Pace, I love you, pace, virus, pace. They then had three children of their own and they started to realise that the programme that they bought 12 years ago um, was incompatible with this new family, adolescence. 
the eldest cut, pace cut. They placed me into children's homes and they said they would never write to me or be in touch with me. Again, cut, paste, select all, cut, paste, quit, trash, open file, family. They withdrew the memory. I lost my town, my school, my first girlfriend, my sisters, my brothers, my father, my mother, sisters, aunts, uncles, granddad, grandma, great grandma. And on the way to the children's homes, uh, from the, pr the, the programming kicked in. And uh, uh, I said uh, to the social worker, I know this is my fault. I'll ask God for forgiveness. I said, uh, and he said, none of this is your fault. None of it cut. From then, 12, uh, I was held in four different children's homes and the last one was a virtual prison and as I had nobody to complain about me, they could do anything to me. Uh, from there, I was banished at 17 with no one. The first thing I did when I left care was ask for my files, the memory of me, the relativity, and uh, I began the search for my mother from that one letter that she wrote, um, uh, that she wrote uh, in 1968. Meanwhile, I wrote poetry, but when the Guardian newspaper said at 21, have I mentioned, excuse me, that my mother wrote a letter to me, that the social worker gave it to me when I left the care system? I haven't. When I left the care system at 17, he gave me a letter from my mother and she said, I want Len back. I want him to be with his own people in his own country. I don't want him to face discrimination. Um, the Guardian newspaper at 21 years of age r said that I had success written all over my f forehead and I knew that, that their idea of success was not mine. I used every little bit of nori notoriety to go back to build the programme, access memory. Memory needed, needs evidence to dispute. All family is at the end of the day is a group of people arguing over the same memory over a lifetime. In 2012, and I didn't have a family, and I didn't have anybody to argue over any memory that I had. In 2012, over 30 years after I made the request, I made a documentary called Child of the State, and this is how that documentary ended. Um, Andrew, this is the one... The the uh, my files. Yeah. Yes. We've got this mythical place that nobody knew about called the Iron Mountain. And files that have been closed for a period of time get stored securely in this iron mountain which is actually i don't know why but it's in scotland it could take some time yeah. but generally we you know we can spend as much time as we need to once i get my hands actually on the files that was in 2012 that that lady didn't care she said that there's a mythical place called the iron mountain and then she went on to say the files are with them and we'll get back to you when we found them she never contacted me again and i never heard from her she was one of the staff in woodend assessment center which i will tell you about in a minute there is a reason why i'm telling you this in connection with digitization and in connection with empowerment Meanwhile, in poetry, my poems can be found on the Left Field album, Leftism. Um, my poems can be found on the walls and streets of London, Manchester. They can be found in books. They can be found on the curriculum. Throughout my 20s and 30s, any newspaper coverage was, again, proof that I was alive. The Left Field album came out in 2000. The digital world is deeply personal. I blog. And I blog because of relativity. Uh, no other reason. I blog because I can point at any given time and place and say I was there. I blog because it holds my memory in my mind and I, I, to this day, have no family to hold that memory in mind. I blog because on any given day I can say I was alive. I am here. I blog and it doesn't matter if you read it or if you don't. I don't care. There are no adverts on my blog, blog but in some weeks, uh, some weeks thousands of people read it. Some weeks there are like five. Um, uh, if there is a theme, then it's a theme of its own. I blog because it's proof that I'm alive. My grammar is terrible. My spelling needs work. But I was here then. And after all, uh, like them or not, uh, that's all a family does. I was here then. I am here now. A collection of memories disrupted disputed or agreed between one group of people over a lifetime. I blog because of the abuse in those homes would end. I wrote about it and slowly grown men in their 40s found themselves weeping. They began to tell their stories. This particular blog has hundreds of, um, of, uh, of uh, comments beneath it. Uh, I blog because my blog is the undisputed fact that I, ha I was alive at any given time. I blog because it's a space where I can be myself outside of myself and that is who we are in family. All my spelling mistakes and grammatical uh, mistakes are there. I'm not looking for recognition, but if you say where you if you, you say where you were, I can s legitimately say I was here then. Presently, 
uh, eight members of staff are under caution by the police as we speak. Uh, Wood End Assessment Centre has been closed, all memory of it fa has disappeared, but the simple act of writing down that I was there then meant that people could find a place to speak about the abuse that they had in that place. Earlier on this week, I received my own files for the first time. Um, the head of Wigan Council uh, said in a BBC interview recently, Andrew, is it there? Thank you. Wigan, Wigan Council has apologised to the poet Len Cisse and anyone else who may have been the victim of abuse at Wood End Assessment Centre. Lem Cisse, who was at the care home sporadically as a child, says boys there were beaten, punched and kicked under what youngsters have described as a brutal regime. I've spent my adult life trying to deal with the effects of what happened to me inside those walls, inside that institution, inside that place of secrets. Donna Hall, the chief executive of Wigan Council, spoke directly to them, Cissé, and to the other alleged victims. I think the message to them is a really profuse apology for the fact they've had to wait so long. Um, we will continue to try to get conviction. Uh, some of what I've heard is horrendous criminal activity. They were, and it has a, had a massive effect, as they obviously know, on the rest of their lives. And we will do what, everything that we can. We'd like to apologise face to face to all of them as well. Um, I, uh, I run a thing called the Christmas dinner. The worst day, uh, quite often, uh, is for the care lever is Christmas day. Uh, and it is, uh, it, it started in 2013. Uh, uh, the, w the worst day of all for most of my adult life has been Christmas day, a concertina of memories. Uh, I wanted to change that. I do this for myself. Uh, I knew other people felt the same. Other care leavers, uh, people between the age of 18 and 30 who leave the care system with those memories and experience and nobody to share them with. Uh, this isn't about sharing. What I do is, uh, it's not an organisation, it's no institution, it's, 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 I don't want it to be an institution. What I do is I get a group of people, dynamic people, uh, from the CEO of the Children's Services to uh, business leaders to the woman who started um, a, a company called... Uh, Oh, it's got a shop in Bloomsbury. It's called Life. Oh, oh, I got a bag from it. Oh, her name's Sophie Howarth. It's the, the School of Life. It's the School of Life. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> An incredible woman. And she's, she's actually in that picture somewhere. Um, the, the point is, is I get them together around a table and say, let's do a Christmas dinner for care leavers in this area. We have no money. We need a venue. We need a blah. We need, a pre we need brilliant presents. We need uh, referrals. We need volunteers. We need er er basically everything. And it's got to be rigorous. And the standard's got to be high. It will not be an institution. Nobody is the chair. Nobody is a boss. No, there is no uh, allocated minute taker necessarily. There is no... Uh, and we try to raise funds. Uh, but not for the goods. Everything's got to be given. Uh, and we raise £5,000 per Christmas dinner only as contingency fee if we need an extra oven. We get top chefs in Manchester. We get the chef for Manchester United and Manchester City. Uh, he, the same chef does both things because it's one company who does them all. Just uh, mentioning football in Manchester. It's, never, uh, it's quite boring, but still, there it is. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in 2014, we did that in 2000, 2014, we set, set one up in Manchester and London in Hackney at the Russet, which is just incredible. Uh, one Piece, the onesie company gave us. In Manchester, there, uh, can you tell this is not scripted? <laughs> uh, sorry, oh, speaker, yeah. Uh, yeah, in Manchester uh, and uh, uh, in London, we, uh, yeah, my time's up. Uh, can we just roll those other pictures just really quickly, please? That's me as Chancellor of the University. Bit of a tosser, but carry on. <laughs> that's, that's me with the students. I don't know why I'm pointing at that now. So everything's gone into meltdown because I'm just a minute away. Can I just finish this off? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Just uh, less than a minute. The point is, is that uh, this presentation, I'll just cut to the end. Uh, no, I won't. I'll, yes, I will. One minute. I return to London tomorrow. I've been here for two days. I'll go to the Beauvoir Square. What was it? Thank you. Beauvoir Square, near where I live. And I'll, I'll meet uh, Richard, the guy from the tweet at the beginning. And he'll give me back my wallet. 
uh, he could send that tweet um, to me because he found my name. Uh, a few weeks ago, I received my files from Wigan Social Services, and because of my blog, a police of investigation is underway, not because of any abuse that I have outlined, but because of the many broken men who found my blog as the only evidence that horrific brutality did happen to them, where they could speak. This presentation is about the written word and the spoken word. Do not think of words as something that transports an idea. They are the idea in themselves. Kurt Cobain said, who needs action when you've got words? Because words are the ultimate action. Once it is spoken, once it is said, it has become something very, very real. My name. Um, in finding my mother and my family, I found out what my name, Lem, means. It said lemon uh, in Ethiopia. Thanks, Mum. Um, <laughs> but in Ethiopia, I've, I learned lemon uh, means the question why. Nobody calls their child why <laughs> in any freaking culture. <laughs> in any culture. I have people in Ethiopia stop me on the street, they're like, lemon? <laughs> just to test whether it works. <laughs> I am not kidding you. Um, uh, the national dish <laughs> in Ethiopia is called what? <laughs> <laughs> when I first met my sister, she said, lemon. I said, what? She said, what? I said... <laughs> um, it's... it's, it's uh, there's hardly anyone in the world called why. I'm the Chancellor of the University of Manchester. There are some of the students um, in us, the revolution for me is now the boy who could write the blog that led to the police investigation. It is not the question why when it comes to diversity and a more exciting dynamic society. It's why not? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. So, yeah. Just one quick question. Yeah. Uh, on your way here, did you stop by the Queen? The Queen's place? <laughs> Is that? No, that was that was actually a couple of months ago. A few oh right. Months ago, okay. A few, cool. A few months ago. Okay. And uh, I put um, I put uh, I put that up there because I thought it was fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it has been it has been liked quite a few times. Yes. And um, in fact, I think I've I've liked it as well. Now. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, any welcome. picture of the Queen always gets a. Uh, gets a hit, um, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for such a powerful and fascinating ending, as well as entertaining, to Good. Thank You Digital Manchester. It was awesome. Seriously. Thank you. Can I just say one thing, and that is that yeah, being please. creative has been the light that's taken me through all of this and, mm. and beyond. The act of writing a poem, the act mm. of engaging with the story outside of a prescribed kind of uh, agenda mm. is what happens in creative process. Mm. And that leads, counterintuitively, to concrete answers. Awesome. Well, I think we've heard that thank a few you. times. And thank, thank you. you.